This is the first part of the lecture that's going to be given on Friday, October 13th uh, on memory, uh, as well as forgetting and memory construction. Uh, for this recording, I will be doing the first three sections of the lecture, but not the last one, which will be done at a second time. When we talk about memory, the first thing we need to talk about is the information processing model which looks really crazy and really complicated. But ultimately, this is what really shows the entire process of memory as it occurs in a human being. For memory, there are three distinct phases, encoding, storage, and retrieval. Encoding is when the information is put into our brains using our senses. Storage is when we use various techniques uh, to rehearse uh, the information or practice it, uh, which allows us to keep it into our memory, uh, especially into our long-term memory. And then retrieval uh, is when we access that memory later on. As far as the memories themselves go, uh, each one has kind of some distinct characteristics. Sensory memory can hold three to seven items and will last up to about three seconds. Short-term memory and working memory, and we'll cover working memory a little bit later, uh, can hold seven to nine chunks uh, for about five to 15 seconds. Uh, and then our long-term memory, uh, our capacity to remember is infinite. And with enough practice and enough rehearsal, the duration of that information will remain permanent. Let's start with encoding. When we talk about encoding, uh, we are talking about the information that we're putting into our brain. But this can come into one of two ways. Automatic processing occurs when we are remembering uh, implicit memories or memories of skills. Additionally, automatic processing also means that you are just remembering stuff without any sort of effort, without thinking, and you're almost doing it unconsciously. Uh, additionally, without the, aside from those memories of skills, you're also remembering associations. So like, for example, if a dog attacked you when you were really young and you saw a dog later on in your life, you might automatically tense up without even thinking about that event in which the dog attacked you. Uh, and finally, uh, we also automatically process information about space. So, for example, uh, we'll remember where uh, a certain piece of information is, but without any sort of effort. We'll encode that into our brains without any sort of effort. Uh, time, uh, if you've forgotten something, you can uh, go back and through the different events that you've experienced that day uh, and to note the sequence of the events. Uh, and then frequency, um, you don't even think about it, but your brain will automatically encode how many times that you've done a certain task today, uh, such as this is that second time that I run into that person today during school. Effortful processing means that you're giving conscious awareness towards the information you're trying to encode. Uh, for example, Right now, reading becomes automatic. Accessing the memory of what certain sounds are and how to put those sounds together is automatic. And encoding that information is automatic. But learning to read wasn't always automatic for you guys. Um, probably when you were very young, you worked really hard to pick out letters and connect them and to create sounds. But through experience and practice, it became automatic. It became uh, something where you don't have to provide conscious awareness as you put that information into your brain. Sensory memory is the first type of memory that we experience, and this usually happens when we encode something. And sensory memory uh, is fleeting. It's the images and the sounds that our eyes and our ears pick up without any sort of attention being a paid, paid to those uh, specific areas. Uh, so like, for example, when you see a face of someone in a large crowd and then you don't pay attention, and you don't remember it. 
Uh, now, you remembered it for a couple of seconds, because as, as I mentioned before, we remember for uh, one to three seconds, and we can remember um, up to about seven to eight items. <clears throat> now, there are two types of sensory memory. There is iconic and echoic memory. Iconic memory is the visual form of sensory memory. Uh, it's what uh, allows us to record those various things that we see. Um, and then though, if we don't pay any attention to it, then that information is lost. Echoic memory is very similar, except it is the auditory version of sensory memory in which we hear a sound uh, and we will remember it for a couple of seconds. But if we're not paying attention to what it is we're hearing, we're going to lose all that stuff that was said. If you look at these letters here, how many letters did you remember? Probably it was maybe three or four or five. And if you were paying attention, maybe you got six or seven, but you probably didn't get all nine. Um, and that's because our sensory memory doesn't allow us to record all that information uh, if we aren't paying attention. We can record it all in our brains, but we can only remember five to seven items. So when we look at our information processing model, we see that sensory memory is the first thing that happens as we begin to encode information into our brain. Our short-term memory lasts a little bit longer, and our short-term memory is created when we pay attention to those things that we're encoding in. As I mentioned before, uh, our short-term memory can hold anywhere from five to nine chunks. Chunking is a way of putting more than five to seven to nine items into our brain for our short-term memory. Chunking is a way uh, to create a meaningful whole out of many different individual parts. Uh, for example, when you see this, it's very difficult to chunk it because there's no meaningful connections. And yet, when you see this, you can probably remember all these letters, even if I covered it back up, because again, there are meaningful connections. Uh, a couple other examples of this. If you try to remember all these letters uh, for, let's say, I give you 15 seconds to look at it, you're probably not going to remember them. But yet, if I give you this one, now you're going to be able to remember them. Instead of remembering each letter individually, you're remembering them in chunks, or in this case, words. And by remembering each one in chunks, we can actually remember every single letter that's in this line. Uh, this can even work on a larger scale as well. If you had this, which a whole bunch of nonsensical words, obviously, uh, they're all English words, but there's a lot of words there to try to remember. Uh, and yet, if you looked at it like this as phrases, then you would only need to remember three phrases, which would allow you uh, to remember um, about 16 different words. When we are encoding verbal material, we it can happen on a shallow way or on a deep way. We can process that information and we can encode it into our brains. If we only visually encode it, we're not going to remember it very much because what occurs at this point is that we are only looking at the symbols. And if we have no connection to those symbols, like for example, if I sh showed you something, if I showed you a word in another language, then you might not be able to remember that word pretty soon afterwards. And yet, if I said the word, you might remember it a little bit better. The encoding increases when it's an acoustic encoding, when it's the sounds of the word. And most of the time, this will occur because we're rhyming the word with the with an English word that we might be able to remember. So we're developing a connection. But the best way to process, the deepest way to process and encode these words is through semantic encoding, in which we understand the meaning of the word. And if we understand the meaning of the word, then remembering the word and recognizing that meaning is going to be uh, easier later on. When we talk about storage, storage can occur 
in three different ways, and we can create three different types of memory from this. Explicit memory is something that we would call declarative memory, or memory of facts, memory of ideas, memories that you can declare. These are stored in the hippocampus, the main memory center of the brain, and also our frontal lobe. Our frontal lobe needs to store these memories of facts because without the facts, we can't make judgments and we can't evaluate consequences, which is one of the key characteristics of the prefrontal cortex. Implicit memories are memories of skills. So this is coordinated abilities like riding a bicycle or running. Uh, and these are stored in the cerebellum because the cerebellum is the part of the brain in which uh, coordinated movement and balance is mainly stored. And then finally, we have episodic memory. Episodic memory is memory of events, memory of uh, key ideas. Now, the facts of those memories might be found in the hippocampus, but the emotional connection means that those memories are also going to be stored in the amygdala. And so when we develop that emotional connection to those memories, uh, the amygdala, amygdala plays a big role in those ro memories themselves. Now, some of our episodic memories are probably not very clear, and yet other ones of our episodic memories are going to be very clear and very crisp because these are known as flashbulb memories. And these usually occur with major events that take place when, within your life or some sort of event that has major purpose or major connection. Uh, when we have these really significant events, we remember them really well. They stick out in our mind like a flashbulb going off. Uh, and yet, if you try to remember what happened the day after that event, you probably aren't going to be able to because there's not so much of an emotional connection. This was a word I was talking about. I misplaced this slide. I'm going to change it for the lecture. But this was the word I was talking about with the uh, visual and acoustic encoding. If you tried to remember it just as the word, it would be very difficult. But if you remember the sounds, a little bit better and the meaning even better after that. On the synaptic level, we can see evidence and biological evidence of memory um, with the neurons in our brains. And this is what really gives us this evidence. And so we look at the rate at which the neurons fire. And this shows us in, an, in a type of event called long-term potentiation. In long-term potentiation, when we first encode information of something that we haven't accessed before, we see that the neurons fire at a normal rate. But with repeated stimulation, i.e. practice and rehearsal as we begin to store it into our brains. When we access it later, all of a sudden, even just rehearsing it and practicing it, even a week later, their neurons are going to fire a lot faster. Um, and because they're firing a lot faster, we see that this is evidence that the brain is developing a stronger connection with the information that's trying to be remembered. One way of storing a lot of information in our brain is the testing effect. Uh, the testing effect gives us repeated rehearsal uh, as we listen to questions and we answer them uh, using things like note cards or um, having somebody else test you on material demonstrates that you have encoded it well, stored it well, and have the ability to retrieve it well. Um, and not only that, as you access it later on to practice it during this testing effect, you are rehearsing even further, which allows you to store it more and more complete. The spacing effect is another way that we're able to put a lot of information in our brain. With space repetition, such as five minutes of information uh, gathering at a time, followed by five minute, five minute breaks, we're able to transfer that information into our long-term memory banks. Now, this is really important because if we try to cram a lot of information into our memory banks, as we're going to see when we cover the forgetting part of this section, not all the information makes it. Not all the information it can be stored all at one time. So allowing our brains to have that break and really process the information that we've been storing uh, makes a really big difference. Overall, the effect of rehearsal can't be overstated. Uh, rehearsal is what really allows us uh, to put uh, information from our short-term memory into our long-term memory. Uh, and it's in this way that the encoding process and the storing process work together uh, with rehearsal. The more we encode it by saying a word and hearing it, uh, repeating a phone number to ourselves over and over again, we are not only 
practicing it and keep getting making sure that those neurons are firing faster but we're also encoding it every single time that we practice it so we're encoding it over and over and over again constantly paying attention to what we're encoding and moving into our short-term memory banks over and over and over again until ultimately it gets encoded into our long-term memory retrieval is the third stage of memory our long-term memory is infinite and what's really interesting about our long-term memory is that the information is permanent with enough rehearsal. Working memory is similar to short-term memory. And basically what working memory is when you access information from your long-term memory and you have to remember it to use it in the present moment. Now, as we retrieve it, though, we are limited in the amount of time that we can remember something. Uh, unless we rehearse it to ourselves by saying it over and over again, as we retrieve old information, uh, most of the time it's only going to last for about 15 seconds, the same as short-term memory. But that's really all we need it for. We really only need to access it in that moment, have it for about 15 seconds, and use it where we need to. Now, if we need to try to access it later on, then all of a sudden we're going to have to retrieve more than once or use our working memory uh, over and over again, um, or... Uh, rehearse it uh, after we've accessed that memory and retrieved the information. You'll remember that there are two primary types of memory connected to retrieval, which are recognition and recall memory. Uh, with recognition memory, this is uh, accessing information in which clues are given. It becomes very easy to do. Recall memory, on the other hand, is accessing information without any sort of clues, without any sort of ideas. Finally, there is relearning. Now, when we learn something the first time, we have to remember how to do it, and we are encoding all sorts of information into our brain. But the more we relearn something, even if it's years later, it just becomes a form of rehearsal. Um, so it's a lot easier to retrieve that information, even if we haven't done that skill or access that memory for a long time. Uh, for example, I used to play the piano when I was younger. These days, my daughter is beginning to learn the piano, and as I am trying to help her, I actually remember how to do more because basically when I'm relearning it by looking at the notes again and looking at where my fingers are supposed to go, it has just become another form of rehearsal and allows me to retrieve that information faster and then encode it a little bit more. So ultimately what we see here is we see the full information processing model. Stimuli hits our brain, sights and sounds. Uh, sensory memory holds it for only a couple of seconds unless we pay attention. If we pay attention, it goes into our short-term memory, which allows us to keep it there for 5 to 15 seconds, but we begin to rehearse it, and as we rehearse it more and more and more, we encode it into our long-term memory, and then when we need that information later, our working memory retrieves it, holds it for about 15 seconds so we can use it in that moment, and this is how our memory works. Now, a couple other things about retrieval. Uh, priming is a way to access specific types of information by, by establishing ideas in a person's brain before you ask them for a specific type of memory. So if I asked you to spell the word hair, you might spell it one way, and yet if I showed you a picture of a rabbit, you might spell it a different way, only because seeing that picture of a rabbit primes your brain to remember that there is another spelling of the word hair. Now you may remember it beforehand, but a lot of people don't. And yet once they see this picture of the rabbit, they definitely do because now their brain has been uh, preempted or uh, prepared to remember a specific type of information. Another way that we can retrieve memory a little bit differently is through context or state dependent memory. Context dependent memory is when we learn information in a specific environment, so let's say like our bedroom or a classroom, when we go to access that memory later on, we're actually more easily able to remember that information in that environment because of the context. So the temperature of the air, the uh, kind of background noises, uh, the lighting that we see, all provides context for our brain to access the memory if we learned it in that context before. The same thing applies to state-dependent memory. State-dependent memory is all about a person's state of mind. Um, so you may have heard about something like drunk memory, 
where a person uh, consumes a large amount of alcohol, learns something when they're sober, they can't remember, and yet when they get drunk again, they can because they learn the information or encoded the information in a specific mental state. Uh, this would allow them to obviously retrieve it while in that state because the brain makes the connection. Additionally, mood congruence is another way that we retrieve information, but in that way, it can actually uh, alter or augment or change the way that we retrieve information. Uh, if we are in a good mood uh, and are experiencing good emotions, we, re we may remember a specific thing in our life with a positive context. And yet, if we're in a bad mood, we may remember things about our life uh, or episodes or events within our life that are more of a negative context. Ultimately, one of the as we, we try to remember and access information, we see that there is two specific effects, recency and primacy, which allows us to remember things a little bit better. The serial position effect says that recency and primacy allows us to remember the things that we learn at the beginning and the things that we learn at the end. And all that stuff in the middle is stuff that is forgotten. The reason for this is because with recency effects, it's the most recent information that you've covered, and so your brain doesn't have to go back very far to get it. Primacy is, it's the first thing that you uh, encoded into your brain, and because it was the first thing, you were probably paying more attention to it, um, and um, it sticks out more because it was the first thing that you heard. But the stuff in the middle are the ones that are the most difficult. It's there here where we conclude this portion of the lecture. Uh, we'll be doing the last portion next week.